I appreciate it. This is a Fox News alert. I'm Brett Baer in Washington. Just two days after the president and his party weathered the political storm over his Supreme Court pick, millions of his Supreme Court pick, millions of Americans along the Gulf Coast are preparing for what could be a large dose of the real thing. Hurricane Michael is moving in their direction right now. It is fueled by the warm waters of the Gulf. A couple of days ago, like it was not going to be much, and now it's looking like it could be a very big one. So we're prepared. And good luck. Fox News meteorologist Adam Klotz is at the weather in New York with the track and strength of Michael. Good evening, Adam. Hey, good evening there, Brett. And the president's right. It is looking more and more like this is going to be a big one. Currently, you're looking at the circulation spinning there just off of the coast of Cuba. Currently spinning there just off of the coast of Cuba. Currently a Category 1 hurricane. Winds at 80 miles an hour. Those are going to intensify. And as a result, we're beginning to see hurricane watches and warnings stretching along the Gulf Coast. Etches and warnings stretching along the Gulf Coast. Everything here in this darker red color, that is the hurricane warning, which means uh, the hurricane conditions are headed that way from Pensacola is stretching across Panama City over towards the Big Bend of Florida. All areas, especially there along the panhandle of Panama City, over towards the Big Bend of Florida. All areas, especially there along the panhandle, are spots where you could see the worst of this storm. Here's what we're looking at from a Category 1 climbing up to a Cat 2. Eventually, by Wednesday morning, sitting just off the coast of Florida, Category 3 storm winds at 120 to get closer and closer to there to land. Obviously, you need warm water to fuel these systems in the warm waters. There's like bath water across the Gulf of Mexico. It takes 80 degrees. You're looking at spots closer to 85 degrees. So the fuel's going to be there for this to pick up strength as it continues to head north. There's still a little bit of spots closer to 85 degrees. So the fuel's going to be there for this to pick up strength as it continues to head north. There's still a little bit of indecision here as far as the actual route of where this a little farther off towards the east. But by and large, the larger wind field there is going a little farther off towards the east. But by and large, the larger wind field there is going to affect a large area across the entire panhandle. Put it in motion for you, and you kind of pay attention to the time frame real quick. As this runs up, you begin to see things deteriorate really Tuesday night into Wednesday morning and then through the day on Wednesday. Uh, Brett, as this one makes landfall, it's not going to be like Florence. It's not going to spin and spin and spin forever. It's going to be a quick hitter bringing the... Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. We're about an hour away from the public debut of the most controversial Supreme Court justice in decades. President Trump will be on hand at the top of the next hour when Brett Kavanaugh participates in a ceremonial swearing in following Saturday's Senate confirmation and the swearing in as well. The wounds from the partisan in battle are still raw, with Democrats promising the fight is not over, the president calling the entire challenge a hoax, and Republicans touting enthusiasm from the country. Chief White House correspondent John Roberts begins our coverage tonight from the North Lawn. Good evening, John. Brett, good evening to you. Justice Kavanaugh has already been officially sworn in and taken his place on the court. That was on Saturday night, but the court, that was on Saturday night, but that was a private ceremony. Tonight, President Trump gets the opportunity to take a primetime victory lap at the ceremonial swearing in of Justice Kavanaugh. Of Justice Kavanaugh. Speaking to the International Association of Chiefs of Police in Orlando today, President Trump tore a strip of Democrats over the Kavanaugh confirmation. It was very, very unfair what happened to him. False charges, false accusations. You know, Kavanaugh's confirmation are now suggesting if they take the House in November, they may launch a further investigation into Kavanaugh's past, could even undertake impeachment proceedings against him. Against him. On the White House South Lawn this morning, President Trump reacted angrily to that prospect. Now they're thinking about impeaching a brilliant jurist, a man that did nothing wrong, a man that was caught up in a hoax that was set up by the Democrats using the Democrats' lawyers, and now they want to impeach him. I've heard this from many impeach him. I've heard this from many people. I think it's an insult to the American public. While Democrats still hold a slight edge, so-called intensity measures for Republican voters across the for Republican voters across the country have spiked because of the Kavanaugh hearings. While it may be wishful thinking, President Trump believes a lot of Democratic voters were turned off by the, by the process. The main base of the Democrats have shifted so far left that we'll end up being Venezuela. This country would end up being Venezuela. I think a lot of Democrats are going to be voting Republican on November 6th. On the trip to Orlando, President Trump brought along a guest, the embattled Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein. 
A New York Times report three weeks ago said Rosenstein had been trying to drum up support last year to use the 25th Amendment. Rosenstein forcefully denied the allegation. He and the president spoke for about 45 minutes during today's flight. The press wants to know, what did you talk about? <laughs> But we had a very good talk, I will say. On his arrival back at the White House late this afternoon, President Trump indicated that Rosenstein's job is safe, at least for now. Have you decided to keep Rod Rosenstein in his position? For now. Have you decided to keep Rod Rosenstein in his position? I said that I was going, there was, I'm not making any changes. You'd be the first to know. I'm not making any. President Trump also weighed in on that Saudi journalist, Jamal Khashoggi, who went missing after walking into the Saudi consulate in Istanbul, Turkey, last week. President Trump said he doesn't like the reports that he's hearing about the potential fate of Khashoggi. But the on, John, thanks. Lawmakers here in Washington are now focusing on the midterm elections less than a month away. And there's much speculation about which party will benefit from the Kavanaugh battle. Correspondent Peter Ducey reports tonight from Capitol Hill. Angry anti-Kavanaugh activists have all but left Washington. So now Democratic lawmakers are hitting the road, trying to keep the excitement. Lawmakers are hitting the road, trying to keep the excitement on the left alive. Let's go! 31 days left. How long? For voters hurt by the confirmation, Democratic Senator Elizabeth Warren. For voters hurt by the confirmation, Democratic Senator Elizabeth Warren says, "Take your pain and turn it into power." On November 6th, House Leader Nancy Pelosi thinks releasing the FBI's background check on Ka the FBI's background check on Kavanaugh might help. She's trying to do that while writing to colleagues, "We must not agonize. We must organize. People must vote." So this is about owning the ground on election day. People are already seeing new voices leave the sidelines, like Susan Rice, the former Obama National Security Advisor, who feels so betrayed by Senator Susan Collins voting yes on Kavanaugh, she might run against her in 2020. Uh, she might run against her in 2020. And the previously apolitical Taylor Swift is picking a side, telling her Democrat Phil Bredesen, posting, quote, as much as I have in the past and would like to continue voting for women in office, I cannot support Marshall Blackburn. Her voting record in Congress appalls and terrifies me. But for Republicans, the Kavanaugh calls and terrifies me. But for Republicans, the Kavanaugh confirmation chaos has been a cash cow. The National Republican Congressional Committee, which is fighting to keep control of the House, says 418 percent more money flowed into of the House, says 418 percent more money flowed into its accounts compared to the same week last month. Republicans have had a little lack of enthusiasm, and in fact, we had nine special elections. Majority Leader Mitch McConnell refers to recent Democratic tactics as a political gift. What I think this has done for us is provide the kind of adrenaline shot that we had not been shot, that we had not been able to figure out how to achieve in any other way. The upper chamber is all about tradition and precedent, but some Republicans are so livid about how Democrats approached Kavanaugh, they're about to, are so livid about how Democrats approached Kavanaugh, they're about to change the way they do things in election years. I've never campaigned against a colleague in my life. That's about to change. So it it nobody really seems to know what is going on at the White House. Motivating voters in a month. But before the confirmation conflict, month, but before the confirmation conflict, issues like health care and the economy and immigration were what voters were most concerned about. Will tilt the U.S. Supreme Court dramatically. Many Republicans see the new justice as less of an ideologue and more of a constitutionalist. Tonight, Fox News chief legal correspondent and anchor of Fox News at Night, Shannon Bream, looks at how much Kavanaugh might actually change the U.S. Supreme Court. And anchor of Fox News at Night, Shannon Bream, looks at how much Kavanaugh be viewed as a partisan institution. That was a simpler time, perhaps, just a month ago, before the allegations of sexual misconduct arose. <laughs> Triggering the most bitter Supreme Court confirmation fight in the triggering the most bitter Supreme Court confirmation fight in the Senate's history. But now that he is just as Kavanaugh, the 53-year-old can move ahead with a chance to carve his own path. Whether this is the beginning of his Wikipedia page, it won't be the end. What follows? Whether this is the beginning of his Wikipedia page, it won't be the end. What follows any references confirmation fight is going to be decades of opinions, uh, and so that is what's called a legacy. The 114th justice got to work immediately. 
promised even before the allegations surfaced, has hired four female law clerks, a first in the court's history. He's digging into his caseload, issues like religious liberty, abortion restrictions, gun rights, and the limits of executive power, whether President Trump can be subpoenaed, liberty, abortion restrictions, gun rights, and the limits of executive power, whether President Trump can be subpoenaed in the Russia probe. With a solid conservative majority on the court, the first time in nearly 80 years, progressives worry Kavanaugh will become a long-term power broker. These are fundamental questions of American law and values that a Justice Kavanaugh could be the deciding vote on. Kavanaugh's self-described minimalist approach and respect for precedent in his judicial philosophy is what convinced East Senate swing vote Susan Collins to vote for him, especially when it came to whether the justice would toss out the Roe v. Wade ruling on abortion. I asked him, would it be sufficient to overturn a long-established precedent? He emphatically said no. But some on the current court say it will be hard for the justices, including the newest member, to overcome the perception that they are reflexively partisan. To the extent we can avoid ruling in such expansive ways, we can avoid ruling in such expansive ways as to foreclose continued conversation. I think we have a chance. His critics fear, Brett. Shannon, thank you for more on the newest Supreme Court justice. Let's bring in senior political analyst Britt Hume to join Shannon. Um, Shannon, when you were talking about Justice Kavanaugh, he has written the most opinion, Justice Kavanaugh. He has written the most opinions as an appellate in the U.S. Supreme Court. So one would think his influence perhaps would continue along that track. Yeah, I mean, he, as a member of the D.C. Circuit, that's kind of seen as the second highest court in the country. He really has been an impact and, and a motivator on these justices in the country. He really has been an impact and, and a motivator on these justices as they look at his reasoning, sometimes picking up his reasoning to get to their result. So he's very well respected. He's when they were talking about his temperament, of whether there was anything in his 12-year record on that court that would suggest he had, that he lacked the proper judicial temperament. Brad, I think it's important to, to remember here that there's an important difference between being a political conservative and a judicial conservative. To remember here that there's an important difference between being a political conservative and a judicial conservative. Sometimes the, the, those things overlap, but most of the time they basically do not. A judicial conservative is a judge who looks at a case compares it to the law or the Constitution. A judicial conservative is a judge who looks at a case and new concepts that are not clearly put in the statute or present in the Constitution. At the same time, such judges tend to be reluctant to overturn existing precedents. You heard Susan Collins' confidence about Roe versus Wade to overturn existing precedents. You heard Susan Collins' confidence about Roe versus Wade. Well, that's rooted in part on the things you heard her say, but also in the fact that, as, as uh, Kavanaugh himself said in his confirmation hearing, that there was precedent upon precedent, because that, that case to overturn Roe versus Wade, I would think that it would require some new facts, such as scientific information suggesting that a fetus can feel pain much earlier than we thought before he would go down that road. At the same time, if justices on the court were arguing that they've discovered a right in the Constitution that needs to be affirmed time, if justices on the court were arguing that they've discovered a right in the Constitution that needs to be affirmed that you can't quite find it in the language, I think he'd be very reluctant to go along with that, too. But, Britt, on the politics of this, a lot of talk about the political impact on the midterms. We live in the Trump presidency era. Along with that, too. But, Britt, on the politics of this, a lot of talk about the political impact on the midterms. We live in the Trump presidency era where the bump in motivation that the Republican side has gotten in this is perishable and will fade away by Election Day. And you're right, Brett. Life comes at you pretty fast in this day, and things fade away. Look, we're not. We haven't. When's the last time we talked about in this day, and things fade away? Look, we're not. We haven't. When's the last time we talked about Bob Woodward's book, or the anonymous New York Times editorial, or even, or even uh, the special counsel investigation? However. This was a big moment, this Kavanaugh. It lasted a long time. It was very passionately felt on both sides. The New York Times comes out in the middle of it, in the middle of the front page story alleging all kinds of tax uh, shenanigans by President Trump, and the story fell away without notice to the point where they published it again over the weekend. So I think we have to... ...him followed him. He is now going to move... And ...keep in mind the distinct possibility that the feelings about that result from this are going to last and will be a factor on Election Day. Chief Justice John Roberts, 
you've studied him, followed him. He is now going to move into, one would think, a swing vote position mm -hmm. and also trying to keep the court together mm -hmm. as far as how they rule on different items. Yeah, he really wants them to be seen as apolitical, and I think the justices feel that way too. So he'd much rather come to a consensus, a more narrow in the way that they operate on the court and the way that they see a lot of these issues. Shannon, Britt, as always, thank you. Complete coverage, top of the hour when that swearing-in happens uh, with Martha. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo is on his way back to Washington tonight. He returns from an Asian trip marked by persistent tensions with China and the hope of increasing. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo is on his way back to Washington tonight. He returns from an Asian trip marked by persistent tensions with China and the hope of increasing cooperation with North Korea. Here's senior foreign affairs correspondent Greg Palka. Secretary of State Pompeo in Beijing today, briefing his counterpart there about his meeting with New York. Directly struck the mutual trust of the two nations and cast a shadow over the future of the China-U.S. relations. While acknowledging there are differences, Pompeo called the relationship between Washington and Beijing important, especially when it comes to reining in China's ally, North Korea. In a meeting Sunday with Chairman Kim, the secretary claimed there was significant progress towards the North giving up its nuclear weapons. claimed there was significant progress towards the North giving up its nuclear weapons. One. Kim confirmed a pledge to allow inspectors to visit a nuclear site supposedly destroyed earlier this year, as well as a missile site it says it will dismantle. And they discussed a follow-up to the June Singapore summit of President Trump and Chairman Kim. Pompeo also met with South Korean President Moon in Seoul. I want all of you to work closely with the U.S. and put in Mac. Pompeo also met with South Korean President Moon in Seoul. I want all of you to work closely with the U.S. and put in maximum efforts into making the second North Korea-U.S. summit happen as soon as possible. It is not known if the latest demand from North Korea was discussed, that the U.S. sign on to an end of Korean war declaration, or the current demand from the U.S., a full accounting of the North weaponry, both negotiation roadblocks. We asked for the U.S. a full accounting of the North's weaponry, both negotiation roadblocks. We asked for a full inventory of all of their nuclear sites and all their ballistic missiles, and we wanted a timetable to disarm. That still hasn't taken place. South Korean President Moon also said today that Kim Jong-un is planning other summits, including one with Chinese President Xi. It would be their third. After today, it's not clear what will come out of that. Brett. Greg, thank you. Up next, the details of the worst transportation accident in the U.S. in almost a decade. First, the details of the worst transportation accident in the U.S. in almost a decade. First, here's what some of our Fox affiliates around the country are covering tonight. Fox 11 in Los Angeles as a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket carries an Argentinian Earth observation satellite into space and for the first time lands a first stage booster back at its California launch site. The company had previously flown first stage rockets back to land after Florida launches but never had done so on the West Coast. Fox 29 in Philadelphia as Bill Cosby's lawyers ask a court to overturn his sexual assault conviction because of what they call a string of errors, including the designation of being called a series of conversations. The tour begins November 18th in Las Vegas. That's tonight's live look outside the Beltway from Special Report. We'll be right back. A half degree below. A report from the United Nations says limiting global warming to just under a single degree Fahrenheit could mean the difference between life and death for many people and ecosystems. That is about a half degree below the target world leaders have already set. The inter about a half degree below the target world leaders have already set. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says that half degree could mean fewer heat waves, downpours and extinctions, along with less severe sea level rise. A vigil Saturday in the country's worst transportation accident in almost a decade. And we're learning tonight about the shocking circumstances surrounding that tragedy. Correspondent Brian Yanis has the latest. That vehicle was inspected by... And Yanis has the latest. That vehicle was inspected by the New York State Department of Transportation last... 50 day 
from the Saturday crash of the 2001 Ford Excursion Limousine that killed 20 people in the deadliest transportation accident in the U.S. since 2009. The driver, 53-year-old Scott Lissanikia, did not have the proper license to operate. 53-year-old Scott Lissanikia did not have the proper license to operate a stretch limousine of that size. Lissanikia died along with 17 of the passengers. Uh, the vehicle, um, when it was converted, that, that was uh, the conversion was conducted in accordance with federal regulations. The limousine was traveling down Route 30 in Schoharie, New York, 170 miles north of New York City when it sped past a stop sign into a park. The limousine was traveling down Route 30 in Schoharie, New York, 170 miles north of New York City when it sped past a stop sign into a parking lot, crashing into an unoccupied SUV, hitting and killing two bystanders before it crashed into a ditch. Among those killed, newlywed Aaron Vertucci and her husband Shane McDonald. Aaron reported texting her aunt 20 minutes before the crash, saying the limousine appeared to be in terrible condition. The limo's owner, Prestige Limousine Company, says it is cooperating with authorities. Records show a says it is cooperating with authorities. Records show a history of failed inspections with four vehicles pulled from service in the last two years. In New York, Brian Yennis, Fox News. On Wall Street today, stocks were mixed. The Dow gained 40. The S&P 500 dropped a point. The Nasdaq lost 52 and a half. Up next, what happened to the man in charge of Interpol when he went to China? Turkey and Saudi Arabia are exchanging unpleasantries tonight over a Saudi journalist who disappeared after going to the kingdom's consulate in Istanbul. John Roberts referenced this story earlier from the White House. Now State Department correspondent Rich Edson tells us what we know and what we don't. Prove it. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan says Saudi Arabia should release footage showing missing journalist Jamal Khashoggi leaving the Saudi consulate. Quote, the Saudi consulate officials in Istanbul can't get away with simply saying he left the building. Erdogan says if he left the building, then you need to prove it. Turkish police say 15 Saudis arrived in Istanbul and entered the Saudi consulate last week with Khashoggi still inside. His friends believe what happened next was horrific. He was made to faint, his body dismembered and distributed to these 15 people and taken out. I don't know if it was thrown out or taken. Officials will announce that, and that's what we are waiting for. A Saudi official denies to Fox News any government involvement in Khashoggi's disappearance and says the Saudi government is sending a team to investigate with the Turkish government. Khashoggi was once seen as close to the Saudi regime. He then grew critical of it, moved to the United States, and wrote for the Washington Post Global Opinion section. Pieces titled, Saudi Arabia wasn't always this repressive. Now it's unbearable. And Saudi Arabia's crown prince already controlled the nation's media. Now he's squeezing it even further. State Department officials say they are closely following the situation. Reporters also asked President Trump about it. I, I am concerned about it. I don't like hearing about it. And hopefully that will sort itself out. Right now, nobody knows anything about it, but there's some pretty bad stories going around. I do not like it. There has been no further comment from the administration. Republican Senator Marco Rubio tweeted, quote, if this deeply disturbing news report is confirmed, the United States and civilized world must respond strongly, and I will review all options in the Senate. Democratic Senator Chris Murphy responded, agree. Ready to work with you, Marco Rubio. Turkey and Saudi Arabia already had substantial differences. Last year, Saudi Arabia and its allies blockaded Qatar. Turkey has sided with Qatar, even sending additional Turkish troops there. Brett. Rich Edson, live of the State Department. Rich, thank you. Chinese authorities say they are investigating the former president of Interpol for bribery and other crimes. The man disappeared last month, and we're getting new details tonight about what's going on. Reporter Kitty Logan has that story. Meng Hongwei was China's first head of Interpol. Two weeks ago, he disappeared. On Sunday, he resigned. It then emerged he was in custody in China. The Chinese authorities say they're investigating Meng for taking bribes and for what they say are other crimes. I believe the investigation fully shows the Chinese government's unswerving determination in pursuing law-based governance and fighting corruption. 
It's unclear if the bribery allegations are directly related to Meng's work at Interpol. The authorities have given no further details. The circumstances of his disappearance have raised some concerns that his detention may be politically motivated. It's very unusual. International organizations like Interpol, they need to function independently. Meng's wife, who wishes to conceal her identity, says her husband vanished after flying home to China from France at the end of last month. On Sunday, she appealed for help, showing reporters a text he'd sent her with a knife emoji. She believed he was trying to tell her he was in danger. This issue is about fairness and justice. It is about the international society and about my motherland and its people whom I love. An hour after this TV appeal and under pressure from both French authorities and Interpol, the Chinese government finally admitted Meng was in its custody. Interpol confirmed Meng's resignation the same day in a brief tweet. The organization says that until then, it wasn't aware its president was under investigation. China is facing scrutiny for the sudden and secretive detention of such a senior international official. But for now, Meng remains in custody, although he's yet to be formally charged. Brett? Kitty Logan in London. Kitty, thanks. Now that Brett Kavanaugh is a justice on the U.S. Supreme Court, will the partisan war over his confirmation subside? And what impact could it all have on the midterms? We'll ask our panel when we come back. I thought the way they behaved was absolutely atrocious. The way they really tortured him and his family, I thought it was a disgrace. The main base of the Democrats have shifted so far left that we'll end up being Venezuela. This country would end up being Venezuela. I think a lot of Democrats are going to be voting Republican on November 6th. All these angry people out there, they know that it is the people who are sitting in the Senate that they've elected who are making these decisions, and they're going to go to the polls, and they're going to vote uh, differently. Both sides saying that the Brett Kavanaugh situation, now Justice Brett Kavanaugh, will motivate their sides come midterm elections. Look at uh, just some of the races that some of the polls have shifted uh, in the past week. The Florida Senate race uh, before uh, Rick Scott was up 1.6, now Nelson up 2.4, Arizona was a pickup for uh, Sinema, the Democrat there in Arizona Senate race, the Texas Senate race before Cruz 3.4, now uh, Cruz by six. How it plays across the country and whether it's really tied to Brett Kavanaugh or not, well, that's what we have a panel for. Chris Starwalt is politics editor here at Fox News. Leslie Marshall, syndicated talk radio host and former White House press secretary Ari Fleischer. You know, we just picked out those three, Chris. You look at some other polls that have come out this week about uh, enthusiasm, Democrats and Republicans, NPR, Marist poll, up to 82 percent on both sides. Um, how does it play? The volume goes to 11 on this one. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we were just having a discussion, a decision team uh, call where we were talking about what we expect turnout to be. And honest to goodness, I cannot tell you right now what kind of a turnout situation we're looking at. 2014 saw the lowest midterm turnout since 1942 when we had some other stuff to deal with. And I have no idea whether we're going to see a surge on both sides, a lopsided, or are a large number of people going to be so disgusted by what's going on, so grossed out by the current political climate that they just, uh, that they absent themselves. But it's clear that the mum, the the whole thing motivated both sides? It, look, <clears throat> I think the rule of thumb here is if you're playing out of position, this was a bad week for you. If you're a Republican in a blue state, it's a bad week for you. If you're a Democrat in a red state, it's a bad week for you because what it's done is brought the intensity up on both sides. It's more important for Republicans, though, because they were lagging. So this gave them something they, they needed. Leslie, thoughts? I agree, but I think it's temporary, except for women. Um, you know, when you're at a restaurant and you don't like your food, you ask to speak to the manager. And I think it's it, it's like that. The Democrats are angry. When other people in this country were angry, whether they're Republicans, Democrats, independents, you ended up with Donald Trump as president. So I think we are going to see numbers that we haven't seen in certain communities. I think millennials will come out, Latinos, but women. I think this is really going to be the year of, of women. And I think Kavanaugh, this whole situation has definitely, as we see in numbers, has had some women in the Republican Party say, mm, this isn't for me. Well, the president addressed that on Air Force One, uh, asked the question about women in the elections. The women, I feel, were in many ways stronger than the men in his favor. So 
You have a lot of women that are extremely happy, a tremendous number of women, because they're thinking of their sons, they're thinking of their husbands and their brothers and their uncles and others. And women are, I think, extremely happy. All right, you know, it depends on where you are. Do we see these suburban districts, uh, house races, where it seems like the president's approval is underwater and maybe even more so after this Kavanaugh situation. But other places, it plays exactly opposite. Well, there's been one factor that we've seen for a year, and it's consistent, and that's Democrats are fired up. Special elections that Republicans typically win by double digits, we were winning by one digit. And in the case of Pennsylvania, we lost a safe Republican district. What's changed now, and the question is how long will it change, is conservatives are fired up. Now, let me give you three numbers on why that's so important. 32, 42, 37. When George Bush Carl was Rose president, had a whiteboard. I mean, why didn't you bring a whiteboard? <laughs> where the props? Seriously, I mean, where's the props? All right, all right, all right. Okay, all right. 32, 42, 37. Okay. In 2006, Bush's last midterm, when he lost the House and the Senate, Republicans lost them all. The percentage of the electorate that said they were conservative was 32 percent, a very low number. Four years later, Barack Obama's first midterm, 42 percent of the electorate said they were conservative. Republicans won the House in the biggest midterm sweep in 70 years. Four more years later, the second. Second Obama midterm, 37 percent of the electorate identified as conservative. Republicans took the Senate. The point being, if conservatives sit at home and sit out the election the way they did in 2006, Republicans are dead in the water. If, as a result of the Kavanaugh hearing, conservatives get fired up, they decide we're turning out, there's too much on the line, you could have a very different election. And so far, it's all been in the Democrats' favor. In the last four weeks, it may shift. All right. Um here is one poll, the NPR PBS Marist poll I referenced earlier. Uh, job approval, it's out today. Job approval for the president, 41 53. That matches our Fox numbers roughly. Um, at that approval number, uh, how does that play across the country? I mean, at each state, there's a different kind of Trump approval and how it factors. That's right. And so the, the president is back to sort of the upper end of his range or approaching the upper end of his range. He has lived essentially 38 to 42 or 43 percent. That's been his space. Sometimes it's up a little, sometimes it's down a little bit. The real, if I, if I can posit this, and this is just a theory I have, and I don't know if this is going to hold, but I think arguably the best part about the Kavanaugh mania, about all of this explosion, biggest news story I can remember, biggest political news story I can remember certainly in two years, was this. We weren't talking about all of the stuff that we're usually talking about. I think one of the reasons that the president's approval numbers are, but he did have a very good week and all of the good news that he had on NAFTA and everything else. But also, the focus has been off of Trump for a second. It's been on something else for a while instead of constant, constant, constant Trump focus. And I think that helps him get back up in the upper part of his register. So I just wanted to point this out. Taylor Swift has weighed in <laughs> on a race in Tennessee. Uh, Taylor Swift is putting on Instagram as much as I have in the past and would like to continue voting for women in office. I cannot support Marsha Blackburn. Her voting record in Congress appalls and terrifies me. Appalls and terrifies me. Uh, let's take a look at the race in Tennessee. It's for Senate. Uh, Marsha Blackburn, a Republican, and the Real Clear Politics average has her up about 2.7, and the president decided to weigh in on this uh, today. Marsha Blackburn is doing a very good job in Tennessee. She's leading now substantially, which she should. She's a tremendous woman. I'm sure Taylor Swift has nothing or doesn't know anything about her. And uh, let's say that I like Taylor's music about 25% less now, okay? I just wanted to play that soundbite. But the point is that everybody has a, a, a point of view, you know? I mean, and they're obviously Taylor Swift is, is weighing in. Well, I know some people might say whether they like her music or not. Who cares? Why do we care about her political opinion? But millennials care. And uh, people that may not come out and have not come out, certainly for uh, my party, when you were looking at, unlike the president said, a substantial lead, I don't consider 2.7 substantial, less than 3%, certainly within the margin of error. And we are talking about a very red state. Uh, to, to see a Democrat, uh, you know, less than three points uh, behind a Republican in a state like Tennessee, I think is very encouraging for Democrats. But we are 29 days. The news cycles, as I mentioned with Britt Hume earlier, are about six or seven per day. Yeah. So we're going to be looking at a lot of shiny things between now and Election Day. That could change the dynamic entirely. 100%. And by the way, I am for whatever Meatloaf or Robert Earl Keen, whoever they endorse, <laughs> I'm with those two right there. Um, two out of three. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well done. Oh, that was good. Check it off. Oh. 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 Hey. All right.
I, I got to run. Make your point. <laughs> Back to politics. Uh, nine races count in the Senate. Three are races Republicans could lose. Arizona, Nevada, and Tennessee. There are six that the Democrats can lose. And so the math is still with the Republicans, and nine races are very close and could go either way for either party. So Democrats could take the Senate if they run the table. Republicans could have a very big night in the Senate. We don't know yet. All right, next up, the search for a Saudi journalist missing in Turkey and how that plays internationally. I thought the way they behaved was absolutely atrocious. The way they really tortured him and his family, I thought it was a disgrace. The main base of the Democrats have shifted so far left that we'll end up being Venezuela. This country would end up being Venezuela. I think a lot of Democrats are going to be voting Republican on November 6th. All these angry people out there, they know that it is the people who are sitting in the Senate that they've elected who are making these decisions, and they're going to go to the polls, and they're going to vote uh, differently. Both sides saying that the Brett Kavanaugh situation, now Justice Brett Kavanaugh, will motivate their sides come midterm elections. Look at uh, just some of the races that some of the polls have shifted uh, in the past week. The Florida Senate race uh, before uh, Rick Scott was up 1.6, now Nelson up 2.4, Arizona was a pickup for uh, Sinema, the Democrat there in Arizona Senate race, the Texas Senate race before Cruz 3.4, now uh, Cruz by six. How it plays across the country and whether it's really tied to Brett Kavanaugh or not, well, that's what we have a panel for. Chris Starwalt is politics editor here at Fox News. Leslie Marshall, syndicated talk radio host and former White House press secretary, Ari Fleischer. You know, we just picked out those three, Chris. You look at some other polls that have come out this week about uh, enthusiasm, Democrats and Republicans, NPR, Marist poll, up to 82% on both sides. Um, how does it play? The volume goes to 11 on this one. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we were just having a discussion, a decision team uh, call where we were talking about what we expect turnout to be. And honest to goodness, I cannot tell you right now what kind of a turnout situation we're looking at. 2014 saw the lowest midterm turnout since 1942 when we had some other stuff to deal with. And I have no idea whether we're going to see a surge on both sides, a lopsided, or are a large number of people going to be so disgusted by what's going on, so grossed out by the current political climate that they just, uh, that they absent themselves. But it's clear that the mum, the the whole thing motivated both sides? It, look, <clears throat> I think the rule of thumb here is if you're playing out of position, this was a bad week for you. If you're a Republican in a blue state, it's a bad week for you. If you're a Democrat in a red state, it's a bad week for you because what it's done is brought the intensity up on both sides. It's more important for Republicans, though, because they were lagging. So this gave them something they, they needed. Leslie, thoughts? I agree, but I think it's temporary, except for women. Um, you know, when you're at a restaurant and you don't like your food, you ask to speak to the manager. And I think it's, it, it's like that. The Democrats are angry. When other people in this country were angry, whether they're Republicans, Democrats, independents, you ended up with Donald Trump as president. So I think we are going to see numbers that we haven't seen in certain communities. I think millennials will come out, Latinos, but women. I think this is really going to be the year of, of women. And I think Kavanaugh, this whole situation has definitely, as we see in numbers, has had some women in the Republican Party say, mm, this isn't for me. Well, the president addressed that on Air Force One, uh, asked a question about women in the elections. The women, I feel, were in many ways stronger than the men in his favor. So you have a lot of women that are extremely happy, a tremendous number of women, because they're thinking of their sons, they're thinking of their husbands and their brothers and their uncles and others. And Women are, I think, extremely happy. All right, you know, it depends on where you are. Do we see these suburban districts, uh, house races, where it seems like the president's approval is underwater and maybe even more so after this Kavanaugh situation? But other places, it plays exactly opposite. Well, there's been one factor that we've seen for a year, and it's consistent, that's Democrats are fired up. Special elections that Republicans typically win by double digits, we were winning by one digit. And in the case of Pennsylvania, we lost a safe Republican district. What's changed now, and the question is how long will it change, is conservatives are fired up. Now, let me give you three numbers on why that's so important. 32, 42, 37. 
when George Bush well, was Rose president. Had a whiteboard. I mean, why didn't you bring a whiteboard? <laughs> we're the props. Seriously, I mean, where's the props? All right, all right, all right. Okay, all right. 32, 42, 37. Okay. In 2006, Bush's last midterm, when he lost the House and the Senate, Republicans lost them all. The percentage of the electorate that said they were conservative was 32 percent, a very low number. Four years later, Barack Obama's first midterm, 42 percent of the electorate said they were conservative. Republicans won the House in the biggest midterm sweep in 70 years. Four more years later, the second. Second Obama midterm, 37% of the electorate identified as conservative. Republicans took the Senate. The point being, if conservatives sit at home and sit out the election the way they did in 2006, Republicans are dead in the water. If, as a result of the Kavanaugh hearing, conservatives get fired up, they say, we're turning out, there's too much on the line, you could have a very different election. And so far, it's all been in the Democrats' favor. In the last four weeks, it may shift.